What's going on, Recon? It's yours truly here, Jeff White Bear Kingsbury. Welcome back to another episode of Strange Recon right here on YouTube or anywhere a podcast we found. My audio listeners, thank you so much for joining in. Everyone in the YouTube chat, As before we even get going here, thank you so much for being here before the show starts. Some new names in there. Carl the Crusher, thank you very much for being here. Everyone out there, uh, Al Gray, <laughs> that one time I was abducted by aliens, Lord Ludacris. Everyone in the YouTube chat, thanks so much for being here. Let's get the show going. I don't want to waste your time. Usually I like to turn the uh, crowd into an unruly mob and then bring the guest on and hand them over. But this time I'm just going to bring our guest right on. I had him on a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, Chris Bartell, Air Force veteran uh, and a person with a perspective on uh, Skinwalker Ranch, Area 51, and, and just in general, the Bigelow Aerospace uh, Evolution uh, from OSAP, yada, yada, yada. You know, it's, it, he offers a... A pretty, a pretty sick <laughs> point of view that we just simply haven't received and you haven't had in ufology for a long, long time. And we're going to be super grateful for that. So let's bring him on now. Chris, welcome back to the show. Hey, hey thanks for having me. Uh, having me back. I appreciate your time. Oh, man. I just got done listening to uh, to our first interview. I want to make sure I listen to it again just because I didn't want to you know, ask you too many questions. Uh, they were the same, but for all the people that are just joining us and missed the first interview, they, they, they should go back and watch it now. Maybe pause this one and switch over, watch the first one, they come back, time travel, it works. Um, but uh, could you just back up, <laughs> give a little background on yourself real quick on uh, on uh, who you are and, and, and why, uh, obviously, why we're talking about Skinwalker Ranch and your experience, just a little bit, just to catch people yeah. up. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Chris Bartell. I was uh, in the Air Force for approximately 10 years, stationed at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas, Nevada from 1998 until 2009. Well, 2006 active, and then from 6 to 9, I was in the reserves. Um, uh, I was During that time, I was Security Forces Police Officer for Main Base at Nellis, and then I transferred over to Creech Air Force Base as a cadre instructor for a GCTS ground combat training squadron out of Creech and worked there for a couple of years and then um, transitioned out of the Air Force and got hired with the Department of Energy at the Nevada test site um, as a security police officer where I got my Q clearance and worked that world for a, work, for a while. And then um, if my wife, who I met in the Air Force as well, she got orders to Maelstrom Air Force Base and she's from Montana. So we moved there back in late 2009 into 2010 and then um from there we moved back to las vegas and that's when i got hired first with uh a company called csc which held the contract for a51 a lot of my friends worked there so i kind of transitioned over there and at the same time i was hired with them for the janet detail but at first it was escort duty um i got hired with bass for a uh, big aerospace assigned to skinwalker ranch from 2010 to 2016 and then i left the company in 2018 and moved and left vegas after spending 20 years out there and moved back to the midwest and that's where i'm at now currently uh still working for you know the federal police out here and um doing photography and going on adventure still and going back to the Uinta basin and doing investigations with guys like carl the crusher and james keenan and uh brent stone and chris lato and uh Mount Wilson is the next objective where we just came back recently. And that's kind of where my new focus is at. But I come back with, a, I guess, a pretty extensive background in uh, some of these places that are talked about the most. So thank you again for having me on. I know last time I was a little fired up because it was a bad week for me. And uh, I'll, I'll try to be more calm on this, uh, on this, no, on this you, go around. You absolutely killed it. And I appreciate, you know, you just putting on all that out there for all the people that, uh, that need that but i think you know most of the people that watch this channel obviously they know you now and uh, if they didn't know you before but uh yeah in general the uh, you blew a lot of people's minds uh when, when you came on and uh, because you know there's been suspicions there's anecdotal evidence but of course the kind of uh what's that term gaslighting if you will from like right. the internal ufo community that's like no, no 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 these guys wouldn't have you think something else was going on these guys are telling you like it is and you kind of yeah. offer that off up to the side, but not to hype on that because there may actually be weird stuff going on out there. You know, we don't want to just focus on the fact that you were lied to in in certain ways or maybe mis you know manipulated in certain ways. But uh, for all the yeah. people that don't know anything about what we're even talking about right now, which I should probably I, I have a habit of not doing this, and my the ghost of Norm McDonald, uh, my co-host, was <laughs> reminding me that I should tell the folks at home. 
uh, you know, that's, you know, Skinwalker Ranch, Inuit to Basin, uh, long history, native first people history that, that, that uh, the, the Indian history there goes back, uh, you know, hundreds of years. And, and the, uh, it's just strange. We'll just leave it at that. It's, it's peculiar, strange. I've had a lot of thinking, uh, doing a lot of thinking about it recently because of the Bridgewater Triangle, so to speak, and what this place makes you feel like. And uh, I was wondering, I want to pass this by you real quick uh, yeah. before we get into anything specific. Uh, but is it possible you feel like the ranch might put you in an alter, alter, like an alternate state? Like you know, there are individuals that will go into the Hockamock Swamp here, stand on a bunch of giant rocks, and feel like they're in like an altered state of like they're meditating or something. They almost like it shifts them in this position. Do you think that like being on the, this ranch could be in fact, like something that actually like puts you in one of these States? Yeah. I think there's uh, something about being out there when you absorb that energy and you kind of tune in that frequency, um, you kind of realize you're probably in a location that's got some ancient history and so you kind of feel that, you know, you, you go to these areas and you feel that type of history or that energy there. Um, you know, a lot of it also, though, with the ranch is um, people um, having this pre-notion of, you know, reading a book first and then going out there and having this pre-notion in their mind that they're going to see something, you know. And I encountered that a lot when I was out there from people that would come out and visit the gate, you know, or they would come to the ranch. And you got to, I got to remind people, this is back in 2010 when there was no, you know, Skinwalker Ranch was never going to be a household name or a mainstream topic like it is today. But we would still have people come out there and try to trespass. And, and when I would make contact with them, I'd ask them, you know, why are you here? And they would say, well, because I read the book, you know, uh, for the Skinwalker and or I saw a couple of YouTube videos, but there wasn't really many videos back then. So they would come out there kind of expecting to see something. And then a lot of times they would see something and it could be explainable, you know, there, yeah. you know, it could be a, something very explainable. And I even saw that on my own team as well, guys who would get ramped up, you know, and I would, and I gotta be honest, sometimes I would kind of fall in that same trap, you know, being out there alone for, you know, on the second week, I'm out there walking around at night, just the dogs. And I'm like yeah. second guessing myself at certain situations, you know, am I seeing that? Am I not seeing that? Um, but I do feel like being out there, even when I was just out there recently, uh, last year, um, I felt like such a strong connection out there. Maybe it's because of my extended time out there. I don't know. But um, I feel like there is something there that kind of draws people back. And not just specifically Skinwalker Ranch. It feels like that whole Uinta Basin has got that kind of strange vibe. You know, you feel like something's there. And all it takes is to go out and kind of get your you know boots on the ground type of experience and camp out there for as long as you can you know, I always tell people you're not going to experience something just spending one day out there you got to really invest a lot of time out there to kind of absorb what's going on so yeah, yeah that, i feel like there's something out there to that I mean, I've, I've been thinking about that a lot recently as well like i grew up in the place that people like they they, they wrote there's i don't know how many books are written you know have been published about the hockamock swamp you know and uh, <clears throat> I grew up in it. I grew up playing in it. I grew up riding dirt bikes in it. I grew up forever. We would make forts in it. Mm -hmm. um, dig up treasures in it, all types, as I told you about, like how many, you could dig anywhere out here and find arrowheads and, I, and all that stuff. And uh, I just grew up as a part of it. And I really do feel like maybe that's why I see it a little bit different than the people that are just, you know, trying to see what the books have put out there. Right. The, book, the books say the giant black triangles and phantom puckwudgy like beings and and so you know, they go, you know, hysteria. Yeah, that's something I noticed as well. I noticed that um, I'm not speaking for everyone, but there was definitely individuals on my team and probably the team before me who grew up, let's say, in a city environment where all they know is like a major city. And then, boom, you throw them out into a country environment like the, the, you went to Basin where they're seeing, you know, uh, you know, uh, raccoons or possums or anything for the first time. And kind of freaking out about it. And that kind of plays a psychological toll on some people. There was even a guy on my team. Uh, he was born and raised in L.A. And he actually shot his gun at a cow because we had cows out there. But he was so he felt threatened and scared about the cow being so close that he actually shot near it, just scared away. And I was like, are you 
are you crazy? You can't do that. You know, what if you hit one of these cows? They're like five, six thousand dollars a piece, eight thousand dollars. And he didn't understand the concept, but he uh I can tell for him the ranch definitely the scare if you I mean the fear factor out there, I have to admit, is is there if you if you allow it to sink into your brain. So I saw that firsthand. And so if you grew up like that, like I grew up in the country in Kansas, you know, so I grew up looking in the same kind of environment you did. So when I got to the ranch, it kind of felt like going back home for me. It really did. You know, I felt like at peace out there. So that's why maybe I had, maybe that's why I had more positive experiences out there than negative, you know, and uh, I just treated the land, treated the land with respect. And, uh, and, and um, like I said before, I think I might have said it on the last show, but, you know, it helped that my mom raised me with a Native American history and respect because uh, she herself was raised in inner reservations in the four corners. And then my grandfather, same thing. He would take me out looking for artifacts. But during our adventures, he would tell me about the importance of showing respect to the land and, you know, giving uh, tobacco offerings if you find something or, or any type of offering. It could be just saying some words out loud or, you know, talking to the earth and, um, you know, growing up like that out here. But I didn't put it into uh, operational use until I got to Skinwalker Ranch where I was out there alone and was kind of able to fine tune my senses into the environment. Yeah. There is something definitely of a certainly sensory overload for people that have never had to use it. There's always just been walls around them most of their lives and when they're walking around from building to building, like in a city, or even really in an urban place. Even they have trees, but it's it's really yeah. you know I, I don't anyways. But it's it's clear that some people just don't react. But going back, I don't even know where to start with an interview with you, Chris, because it's just <laughs> like you're it's so your story is so wild. Uh, you said something though a second ago. I want to be specific real quick. You mentioned raccoon. I yeah. remember the other animal you mentioned, but is it possible yeah. that one of those animals was a dino beaver? So I've been asked this question a lot. And I, so the specific area in the book where they talk about seeing the dino beaver by Homestead too, that's a location where on many, I'm sure even the new team, I'm sure even the new team now has probably documented the large porcupines that are on Skinwalker Ranch. There's massive, large porcupines that inhabit that area of Utah, specifically the ranch, and they move very slow. And this kind of brings back to what I said before. If you have somebody um, who's born and raised in a city and has a scientific mindset and you put them out in the dark with a flashlight and they're seeing these creatures with limited visibility, it, you know, your imagination could let, let, let wild. You know, I, I saw firsthand, we also had large beavers out there. So I think that's probably a misinter misinterpretation from uh, previously written. I don't believe there was a, I never saw anything that remotely saw a dino beaver. I will say this though, not to try to discredit um, other people's experiences, but I can only speak for myself, but there was another guy I knew who swore up and down. He saw a, a frog with like an alligator snout or something like that. And this guy is from the country as well. And when I, when I kind of pressed him on it, like, dude, are you full of shit? You know, he was like, no, I'm serious. I saw something that looked like, you know, once, once again, it's up for interpretation. Did he get photographic evidence? No. So, you know, it, it, would it be by himself? Yes. I mean, so these things kind of happen. But as far as the dino beaver, I would most likely say that was probably one of the very large porcupines that inhabit that area. Um, I saw him at night out there and i would say they're huge they're very big and they move very slow and they operate they live exactly in that location so um yeah, yeah. i i typed <laughs> i typed in porcupine porcupine uh a new world porcupine in northern utah and there's some pretty serious in size porcupines not just that though they're also like the business logo for icon for yeah. so many businesses in the area it looks like yeah. the dino beaver so to speak no but i yeah, I, I don't want to poke fun. I and, pull up and, let me, and let me piggyback on that. And this is why if you're and, and I'm not I'm not trying to throw shade. I'm just speaking for facts from my background, specifically working for the DOE, working in special access programs before even coming to Skinwalker Ranch. If you're in a position where you're a lead scientist and you make a claim that you're seeing a dino beaver and you have absolutely no evidence to back that claim up. Or if you see, or, or if you said you saw a creature come out of a portal, and you have no evidence to back that up, 
in the scientific scientific community, your credibility kind of gets diminished a little bit. You know, if you're making bold claims like that and you can't back up what you're saying, you probably shouldn't say anything until you can collect that evidence properly. And um, that's why when I was out there, I tried my best to not, you know, to document things that either I can prove with my photography or physical evidence or a second witness, because I came onto the team with a Q clearance and I wasn't going to subject losing my clearance, you know, not falsifying uh, reports, but I wanted to really focus on reporting the factual evidence. And that included debunking some things that were out there that were going on for a long time. So that was kind of one of the things I noticed when I was out there coming from the world before um, I, I kind of felt like there was a lot of guys that didn't really have experience working in real special acts programs, so to say, because um, if you're going to write, you know, write checks like that, you better be able to cash it properly. And um, so that's just kind of my opinion on that. I think people should take that into consideration when they listen to people who want to be the, the so-called experts in some of these matters and look at their background of where have they worked at. If they haven't worked at it like under the umbrellas or under the banner of like the DOE or, you know, 51 or, you know, some of these other, you know, organizations that maybe take a step back and say, well, maybe their credentials are not as what we see and they are, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people should be asked what their credentials are, what their real credentials are versus what we have these uh, kind of bullet points forever. And that's it. I mean, yeah. I know people today that, that, that their titles have shifted from like CIA super soldier to right. GAO officer, you know, whatever. It, um, but <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's, but. it's, it's kind of interesting because I'll be honest with you. And I, and I said this last time and I, maybe I should make it a point again. It was never in my cards to be in a public format to even be having a discussion like this because, because of where I used to work at secrecy is number one thing, you know, like, you don't talk about special access programs until you're basically on your deathbed, you know, or you're retired out of a, out of a program. Um, I only came forward because in 2019, I had learned about some specific details that made me second guess and question my time on Skinwalker Ranch, which led to another investigation that I conducted privately with some other individuals. You know, now, like I said before, I, I do have closure uh, a little bit on my past. Um, but it led to me coming forward and being like, Hey, what's going on? And it was actually, I'm, uh, you're breaking up a little bit, Chris. I'm not sure, but my internet's looking good. And, and everybody else I met James Keenan and every, Oh, uh, let's hold on a second here. If we could one second. Um, that's kind of how I got here. Can you hear me, Chris? Yeah. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? I think we're – oh, I hear you now. Are you there? Okay. Yeah. I'm um, sorry about that. I think I, – well, I'm not sure if everyone else heard, didn't hear. I, I, didn't, I didn't get the last, like, sentence you said there. You kind of broke up a little. Could you repeat that for me? Oh, with um, uh, people's backgrounds and, like, special access programs and stuff. Um, it's just important to remember kind of uh, when people say things, to, to do a – don't take things at face value, basically. And that's how I came onto this platform was because I had questions, unanswered questions. And I came forward and had a community, the UFO community actually helped me kind of put some pieces together. And I stick around now. I stick around now because I want to share people like my pictures of Skinwalker Ranch. And I want to share, share people other images of where I'm going now because I'm still continuing uh, on with my own investigations with Carl the Crusher and James Keenan and these other guys. Yeah. And he went to base and in also other areas because I think I'm here just like everybody else is here. We just want, you know, questions that we all have questions and I'm just trying to put some pieces together. And my focus is always kind of the Native American side of it and kind of piecing those things together. And then uh, using my photography to kind of tap into different dimensions or <laughs> frequencies and uh, kind of show people my vision, how I see things. I like photography, man. It's uh, it's quite brilliant. I like your story, though, in general. Just the idea of uh, being, you know, okay. trying to be an artist and then winding up doing this, and then but then finding yourself in a place that you can actually explore your art. Right. Uh, but one of the things I noticed from it, it, talking to you uh, was it was like you sounded pretty conflicted. Right. And uh, so for all the people that are watching and experiencing Skinwalker Ranch in one way or another, it's it's through probably a television show. Then of course right. the people into the ufology and all this other stuff, the weird history. 
our um, our smaller group. <coughs> Excuse me. But then of uh, then there's like in people like yourself. So um, as I said, you sounded quite conflicted. Can you speak on that a little bit in the sense that you know explaining to the people why you would be conflicted, like your time spent on the ranch, both you obviously miss it, like you said, and, and yeah. great experiences, but then also the dangers that you possibly were in to the people that have no idea what what why that would even be on the t- discussion. Yeah, sorry. Right. So I'll just go through the whole story of it. Basically, you know, I left Skinwalker Ranch in 2016 with a pretty good understanding of what was going on out there, what I what I believe was going on out there. And like I said before, I really believe it's that native history, that energy, frequency, and vibration is displaced naturally in the environment. I think a lot of the negative blowback is um, us trampling on hollow grounds out there, ancient grounds, and not showing proper respect. And I'm not saying my answer is the right one. I'm just saying it's a layer to multiple layers when it comes to Skinwalker Ranch. Obviously, now that the new team that's out there now has discovered way more stuff than what you know I, I discovered when I was working out there. Um, but remind you, I didn't have a team of scientists or all the equipment like they have now. So they have the team that's out there now is very properly sourced and they have the proper backing to get the job done. And they're kind of in a tough spot, you know, because I know Eric Bard is 100% trying to figure things out out there and he's genuine about it. And then, of course, there's a TV show aspect of it. And I don't think the TV show um, has probably helped in his investigation. I know for a fact he's not really a big fan of of the, the production value of the stuff. He wants to be out there really boots on the ground exploring things. But um, there's a TV show now, so you kind of got to roll with that. Um, yeah. And I have total respect for those guys out there doing their thing. But for me personally um, – in 2019, I was asked to be to come out as an advisor for the TV show, and I did. Yeah. And while I was there, uh, it was great because it was kind of like going home again and, and seeing the land and, and seeing some familiar faces and uh, you know meeting the guys for the first time. And the whole reason why I even went out there is because when when Mr. Bigelow sold the property to Brandon Fugel in 2016, we were never allowed to do a proper changeover, right? So we were denied access to help the new guys up right. to speed, right? And I, coming from my background in special access programs and where I used to work at before, and you can obviously relate to this, if you're looking for truth or disclosure or whatever you're looking for, it's very important to share data, right? And so that way you can uh, show the new team, not just security avenues of, you know, deficiencies and security of avenues of approach on the property or areas of interest, but also to, to show the data that you've collected and then maybe they can piggyback on, or maybe they might just scrap their, your data altogether, but we never did a cohesive proper changeover. And that never set well with me. That told me that, wow, maybe my whole time out there was just a big waste of time, you know, or maybe I was out there for a whole nother reason. And that was kind of confirmed by an individual who was working at the ranch at the time. He made the suggestion. He actually made the suggestion. Um, he asked me about, you know, uh, first thing he asked me was about the radiation on the property. And I was like, I didn't know about radiation on the property. None of us knew about radiation on the property uh, um, during that time. And then he asked me about the $22 million. Well, of course, I don't know anything about $22 million. So why would I know about that? I'm just playing my position here, you know. And then the last thing he said to me, and when he said this, my entire world flipped upside down and I had to really kind of keep my professionalism composed. He said to me, you know, how does it feel to know you're possibly a guinea pig out here? And I was just like, holy sh- that now a lot of things kind of make sense. You know, why we're out there alone, limited resources, very, you know, no com- little communication whatsoever. So then when I left the ranch, I kind of my wheels were spinning. I mean, I was like, okay, I was on the phone calling my other buddies who worked out there. And, um, when I reached out to my previous employer, I was kind of met with a very dull statement. And so that just kind of didn't sit well with me. And I'll be honest with you. And probably in 2019 into 2020, I was in a pretty dark place, man. I was pretty upset, pretty, uh, pretty angry. And I know there were some other guys on my team who were very angry as well. That felt like we were used. And then, you know, during the course of my personal investigation, um, we uncovered some documents that kind of proved that there was a possibility we were used as guinea pigs. 
you can know? I ask you a question about that real quick? Yeah, I don't know sure. If you can tell me. Can you tell us who that person was? I know maybe you purposely left the name out, but I, as a, as a curious mind, who who said that to you? If, if you could about you, I, you being I a don't want pig? to. I don't want to say his name. I, out of respect, out of okay, respect. Rhyme with it. make it rhyme. No, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I will say um, uh, he's a very smart scientist, and um, I don't know. It, it kind of caught me by surprise when he said that to me. I was like, what the? F and then when he said that, I was like, okay. But now that kind of leads to other questions that I have is because if this individual said that to me, this individual now works for another individual that was a part of OSAP. And I'm curious to see if he asked those same questions to that individual. So yeah. that's where I'm at now. It's like, okay. And at some point, we all need to have a sit-down conversation in private and kind of lay the cards out on the table and just have a grown-up discussion about what was going on on Skinwalker Ranch, specifically during my timeline. You know, I'm not here to try to sound like a disgruntled employee, as somebody had might have said before online or whatever, but I'm just here with the facts that I know and the investigation that I've conducted with other individuals. And uh, I would honestly, like I said before, I'm the just to close a chapter in my life for my kids. That's it. That's the only reason why I'm, I'm, I'm even steadfast going forward in a lot of the stuff and why I've been to Washington DC several times behind closed doors is just to close a tap chapter for my kids. That's it. And I'm not looking for a payout or any other bullshit that people said I'm here. So that way when my kids grow up, all the, all the questions are answered and they don't have to waste their time trying to go down the rabbit hole like i've been doing the last three years man have been pretty exhausting for me and for my family and you know personally it's been kind of a rough um and it's and i've only gotten through it through the help of the guys i've met like carl the crusher and like taras matla and some other guys and um so i'm sorry i got kind of got off track but uh after you know when i left the ranch in 2019 i was like whoa wait a minute and then I have to bring this up because I brought it up last time in 2019 is when I found out about my MRI stuff. So for everybody who's listening, and, and this is very important, and this is a key, uh, a key uh, detail. Um, oh, we're losing you again. And uh -oh. I thought I asked the guy who told me to get the MRI, you know, why are we going to Reno? And he was like, oh, it's to see if there's any changes in your brain patterns. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we get the MRI done. The guy comes, picks us up, drives us back to the airport, with, takes our documents and leaves. And that's all I hear from it. And then like two weeks go by and I ask my supervisor a loaded question. And remind you, he's not a medical professional. He's a security officer like myself. And I said, you know, hey, what, what were the results of my MRI? Knowing he shouldn't know because he doesn't, he shouldn't have right. access to my medical file. He said, "I will never forget this." He looked down at the ground. He was smoking. He goes, "Oh, everything came back good." And I was like, "Huh, okay." And I kind of put it in the back of my head, and then uh, you know went about my business. Typical, you know, operator, you know, operating like that, not rocking the boat because Mister Bigelow does have a re uh, reputation of if you don't kind of hold the line, he'll just fire you. I mean, Glassdoor.com. There's all about the history of Bigelow Aerospace and how, and that, and that paints a real picture of how it was not to say he was a bad guy, but that paints a real picture of how everything was not just Bigelow Aerospace, but how all stuff was ran as well. Anyway. So in 2019, I find out that my brain scans ended up on it. I saw a document with my MRI scan number on it. Right. And in this document, it talks about damage or in this document, it talks about damage and close proximity to UAPs. And I'm like, what the hell? And then, you know, I go down the rabbit hole and then I see Gary Nolan on Fox News talking about it. And I'm like, what? Nobody ever, you know, sat down with me or the guys that worked up there who lived up there for six years, who actually were actually boots on the ground up there about damage with our extended time on Skinwalker Ranch. So that kind of put a fire under me. <laughs> and it's still kind of a process I'm going down through right now. But yeah, Can that's I, the truth of it. I, I'd love to ask you some more questions about that real quick. I, Steve Long had a, ch a question in the chat. Before we go back to that, I'd like, after this, so I'd specifically, it, it was, 
that no one had really reported anything about UFOs, right? And then them hurting no. you. But to, okay. I never, I never, I never experienced a close proximity to a UFO on Skinwalker Ranch or UAP or whatever you want to UF call it. Um, it, it was. I think they wanted to see the long-term exposure of being exposed to the paranormal or whatever is out there, and then that's where it gets kind of kind of sticky. So. The whole UFO narrative, is it just a, 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 a some type of blanket to cover the fact that there is maybe some type of other non-lethal weapons program being tested on us? And that's why I hate to even say that because I hate to even think that my experiences were somehow mis or uh, <laughs> somehow manipulated outside of my realm of knowledge. You know, I'd hate to even think that, but it's a possibility. And I have to say it's a possibility knowing our government's history with the CIA and the people that are involved in my program all come from the CIA you have Hal put off, you know, Colonel Alexander, all these other guys, Kit Green. So I hate to even think about that, but I have to think that because why else would I have an MRI done if, if I didn't have, and then the, the crazy part is, and it's another smoking gun on. I, so I got a copy of my MRI in 2011. Finally, when I first time ever seeing it, I get the paperwork, the paperwork states, the reason for my MRI was for pre-employment. Well, that doesn't make any sense because I was already employed for over a year with Bigel Aerospace. So somebody's lying and there's a big cover up and you're seeing now, you know, they're talking about Havana syndrome and close proximity to UFOs and UAPs. And I feel like they're kind of just kind of putting blankets over things. You know, they don't want to have a, a normal conversation because that would lead to legality issues because it would show and prove that there was things during the OSAP program that were completely unethical. That's just, the, that's just the utter facts, and I'm very blunt about it because it's the utter truth. There's no other way to even look at it. And um, if, there is another way of, uh, if there is another way of looking at it, if anybody's listening from my past, you know my phone number, give me a call. Or better yet, we need to have a face-to-face -face conversation at some point of this projection. Tell and me it's, it's going to happen. About face-to-face, -face, um, so have have you ever – you've talked to Jay Stratton before? Never met him. Never met him, but you'd like to talk to him. I would love to talk to Jay Stratton. Um, we need to have a talk. We need to have a very serious talk because he was the pro program manager for OSAP, right? And according to that book, uh, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, you know, I know the details of his visit to the ranch. I wasn't there, but my friends were there, the guys who were there before me. And I know the details very well of his visit, and we need to have a discussion because if we're going to sit there and say bad things happen to his family, and I don't doubt for one second bad things happen to his family because things happen to my family and my other colleagues' families. So my, my question is, if bad things were happening back in 2009-10, how could an employer ethically keep people involved in that environment if people are getting hurt, cancer, whatever else is going on? It's completely unethical. So I would never, and if there is things that are dangerous, there needs to be a conversation like, hey guys, this is what's going on. So-and-so has happened, blah, 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 blah. We don't know the reason for it yet. And I believe the reason for the hitchhiker effect, and this is just my own belief, I believe a lot of it has to do with us trespassing on that hollow grounds, on those native grounds, and that energy connects, attaches to you. You go back home and that energy presents itself as a warning, as in don't tread on my property or tread lightly and shows fear. Because I'll tell you when it happened to my family, and it did, my mom, who was raised on any, any reservation, she's the one that made the suggestion, suggestion to stage my house. So the next time I went to the ranch, I took the sage from Skinwalker Ranch and smudged my house, and I've never had a problem since then, even to this day. And every time I leave Skinwalker Ranch when I visit, I grab sage on the way out. And I and when I was out there in 2019, I told everyone, including the production crew, take sage when you leave this property. This is real out here. This is there's real stuff going on. No, um, Someone asked in the chat how big of a role did Hal put uh, did Hal put off play out there when you were there? Never met him either, but I'll tell you this all starts back with Project Stargate, or I'm assuming it does because and Carl the Crusher put it all together. If you want to look at 
I would recommend everyone go to Carl the Crusher's YouTube channel or Carl Vibe and look at what he put together. He pieced it all together in, a, in a, like an eight minute video done incredibly yeah. well, incredibly well. And it starts at Mount Wilson Ranch, Nevada. It starts yeah. at Mount Wilson in 95, 96. I'll put off in 95. I'll put off Stargate program ends. And what does the CIA normally do when the program ends? They go look for funding to keep it going. So he aligns himself with Mr. Bigelow. Mr. Bigelow is a true believer of the paranormal and UFOs. And together they go to Mount Wilson first. And there's this, you know, there's a remote, remote viewing experiments going on out there. They have remote viewers going out there. Um, they view the area and at the, and Jacques Vallée's Forbidden uh, Four, Volume Four, Jacques Vallée says that at Mount Wilson is where they got the phone call to go to Skinwalker Ranch, and that's where Nids shifted direction to Skinwalker Ranch, and then that, and then that would explain, and that's why I, I asked you to remind me when I was at Skinwalker Ranch, we did a, a remote viewing experiment, so we cannot say that no, Hal Putoff's remote viewing or Stargate project had nothing to do with Skinwalker Ranch. Well, then why the hell did I do a remote viewing experiment? I sent you the pictures. Um, we did a remote viewing experiment, myself and some other officers, in 2011, at the very end of the of, of 2000, or no, I'm sorry, in February of 2011. The sad part is, we were never, once again, zero communication. We never got the... So... Now I know why that individual said guinea pig in 2019 because the lack of communication was very ab abundant during my time. Right. And, it, and it had it been done on purpose. And that's why the project failed. The project failed because of lack of communication. It, you know, Lakowski was never out there. He was out there for two hours and goes back to the Pentagon, gets everything rolling through Harry Reid, right? Bigelow gets the contract, OSAP's created, a tip, uh, whatever. Bass is formed. We go back to the ranch. So if I'm operating on a team and I have a guy who has obviously a connection to the property, the key suspect, the key person, that individual needs to be back out onto the property, boots on the ground, to maybe open up Pandora's box even more so we can study the phenomenon, right? That's what we were supposed to do, study the phenomenon. So he just stays in D.C., it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. So the project failed from the start. And that's what I'm saying when these guys didn't have a real knowledge of special access program. That's not how operations work. That's so, not. Chris, you're a very serious guy. You know, you're doing a job. You, you obviously want to make your kids proud. You know, you want to keep your, you know, keep your credibility while also having the integrity to actually talk real about this topic. Right. Um, so let me ask you, you say this followed your wife was it you said earlier like what, back like kind of like the hitchhiker style effect yeah. like we've heard about can you explain to us w why you believe that's related and what what exactly happened and whatnot i don't i've never i don't think i've ever publicly discussed it in detail in person because of, i don't i don't want to i mean I'll, I'll tell you this is what happened basically what happened i you know I, I'm, I'm this is back in 2011 i'm going back to back to the ranch you got to remind back in 2011, there was a small handful of us, maybe five of us total, five of us total operating on Skinwalker Ranch. And this is one guy for two weeks. So basically, you would go to the ranch for two weeks, come back to Las Vegas for two weeks, work at Bigelow Aerospace at the aerospace plant, and then go back to the ranch and then back. So I was gone a lot. We had a brand new baby. I came home one day, my wife had made some comments about seeing something, like a shadow figure. And I'm like, what? And I, I, you know, trying to be logical about it, I thought maybe it was postpartum depression, something like that, because it was our first baby. And um, I saw it too. I saw something that resembled like a big shadowy sphere, like a, it looked like the size of a grapefruit, like a dark ball of smoke. And I did a report on it. Some other things happened too. I won't go in detail, but um, I did a report on it. And that port, report I know went to probably the Pentagon as well because it was the very, you know, this was probably in February or January, probably in February of 2011. Around the same time, we're doing the remote viewing experiment, I believe. And um, 
And that's when I called my mom because I was kind of freaking out, like, whoa, I saw something. And then she's like, you know, I feel like there's something Native American. And, they're, you know, now obviously, the, the whole you went to Basin, it's on a reservation. The history's out there. And this is also around the same time I'm finding artifacts in February. Native American artifacts out there. So I took the sage, did what she told me to do, and never had a problem again. I always felt like when I was at the ranch, I felt like I was being watched or, or like something was there, you know. Did you ever touch any of those artifacts with your bare hands? I sure did. As a matter of fact, I documented <laughs> all the artifacts out there on the property. My thought process was this, and I still kind of believe this. I would find an artifact. I would take a GPS location of the artifact and a picture. Yeah. And sometimes I would take those artifacts back to the trailer at Homestead One to do further analysis and research. Sometimes I would take those artifacts back or to Vernal, Utah, to the History Museum out there and have a professional look at them to get a date. And then my correlation was I was trying, I had a topographical map of the property and I had all these GPS locations where I'd find an artifact. And mm -hmm. I was trying to correlate people's experiences to maybe the abundance of artifacts. And that's where I believe like that energy frequency and vibration is displaced because I was finding that there was people having experiences, what you want to call it, in certain areas of high concentration of artifacts, such as the Eastern Valley, even the tri even the cave that I showed the team last year. I, I found artifacts that led to the cave and that, that probably led to bigger uh, discoveries. You know, I found the wolf traps out there. So, but uh, those artifacts I left at Skinwalker ranch uh, in a little wooden bowl. And some of my, I left out there on the property on purpose because I know nobody else was finding this stuff. And it was very obvious. I took pictures. I, I posted pictures online of the stuff. And the, the reason why is because my grandfather in Kansas raised me to look for this stuff, and I have an eye for it. And, uh, I, you know, my, my, my office is filled with artifacts from our findings when I was a kid from Kansas out here, uh, going out with him every Sunday. Do you uh, – well, how do I word this? I guess it's kind of a little biased. Never mind. Maybe I shouldn't ask it. But, you know, since Steve had asked a question about Mr. Fugel in the ranch, uh, thank you for the super chat, Laura Lucas. I really appreciate that, keeping the show running. Uh, earlier, Steve had asked a question about Mr. Fugel, but to me, it sounds like Mr. Fugel, maybe, maybe this isn't his true desire, but it sounds like he may be interested in some of those artifacts to some degree. Um, and the only reason why I'm saying that is because I've studied Mormon archaeology and some of the things they've claimed to have achieved once they've, you know, received these artifacts and proven like say, uh, some, That's someone cool. else lived there. The, um, Steve, I'm that trying would, to find your question. Sorry, man. Um, that, that would kind of make sense. You know, in 2019, I did find a very specific uh, arrowhead out there. It was a white agate uh, bird point arrowhead. Incredible specimen. I've never found an arrowhead in my life so perfectly done. And I gave it to the team for further analysis and research. And they shuttle boxed it. And I think they have it in their possession out there now, you know. And uh, incredible find. But the crazy thing about this, and I hate to get on the woo side of things, because like I said before, I kind of pride myself for being a professional uh, with my background. But I, I have to say this out loud because it's, it really happened. When I was out there in 2019, my last day as the advisor for the TV show, I asked um, the production team and the team if I can do one of my old walkabouts, my old patrols that I used to do with the dogs. And they said, go for it. And I said, well, do you want to bring a camera guy just in case if I find something or whatever? You know, you never know on the ranch out there. And that's why I carry my camera with me all the time. And he said, no, you know, they were, they were busy with production stuff. So I said, all right, cool. So I go out on my patrol and I hike like I used to do, exactly like I used to do every night, every evening. I had a, I had a routine down. And uh, I ended up on top of the mesa. And I'm out there walking around and I say out loud, I say, what do you want me to show them? I promise you I said that. I walk about 20, 30 steps, and that's when I find the white agate arrowhead on the ground, pointing east, towards the eastern valley, which I believe is the most significant area of the property. My heart was pounding. When I picked up the artifact, I was shaking. And I had the, thankfully, I had the, like the, like the awareness to take a live video, and I videoed it. I videoed me picking it up and documenting the time and date. And I took that arrowhead to 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 uh, I took the arrowhead to 
Candace or, or um, Tom and um, Candace Lindy, who are the archaeologists on the property, their their background is. And I showed it to them. And I said, this is what's important out here. This is what matters. This history is what's important. And they were stunned. And I was stunned, too, because I never found something so perfect. And I think I've shared that image online a couple times on Twitter and stuff for people. And uh, it just was kind of like validating, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know how to really explain it, but that was a very strange event. Of course, nobody's there to document it but me. And, uh, yeah, and that's what I always believe. I believe that Native history is 100% one of the most important things out there. Super interesting stuff, man. I have no. It's like, I, you know, I, I'm. I know a lot of people just have no. They just can't really visualize it or have no reference for it. But I do. Just in general, here's the way I just. Here's, let me throw this. Bounce this off you. I brought up Henry David Thoreau going through Maine all uh, all those years ago and writing about the Algonquin stories, and um. But one of the things I'm just realizing though is, in one of the parts of uh, Thoreau, I believe he wrote. Uh, that the Algonquin uh, that he was with, this northern tribe, um, said uh, to leave offerings for like the mountain uh, spirit or whatever, because uh, you know it would it would act up if you didn't, and they didn't like trespasses on Mount Cahadden, I think it was in, in Maine, and so the they end up finding you know years later, of course, two hundred and fifty years, some odd years later, they end up finding native artifacts and all types of things all over the place out there. It was came like a walking place. They'd all stop and drop stuff off and pay homage to. What do you know? They reported both phenomenon and this mountain of quite literally of uh, of, of artifacts. That I mean, is that is the connection, and we have to really put our mindset at this. We're talking about a group of people. These desert archaic Indians are indigenous people these desert archaic indigenous people that were on this earth for thousands and thousands of years well before us, they had a deeper understanding and connection to everything, the earth, the universe, nature. They were a direct byproduct of nature because they lived in it every single day. And if you think about these indigenous people creating stone tools, they're taking their energy, they're putting it inside the stone weapon to then take the life force out of another animal to feed their family. It's a circle of it's a circle of energy that's going on. Now look at our society now and look how messed up it is. We went the total opposite and we need to go back to the ancient teachings and study the, the tribes who were here before us and learn from them. But we're not going to. I, I really doubt I think some of us will. But the majority of, of humans on this planet are so distracted with um, the modern world, they're not going to go back to these ancient teachings. Um, even uh, there was a guy named uh, Chris Beck, Chief Beck, Navy SEAL guy, on a recent podcast on Sean Ryan's show. He talked about he doesn't read any books that are after the 1900s when the Rockefellers got a hold of the books and stuff. He reads everything in the 1800s, the old teachings with medical stuff and everything. He's been able to kind of like reverse some of the medical issues he's had. And it just proves that the old ways may be the way we need to start thinking again. You know, if everybody kind of understood that the way that our celestial spirit goes forward into the future, whatever you want to call it, um, is, is by producing as much positive energy as you can while you're here, maybe that might be a different type of world we live in. You know, if everybody kind of had that mindset, but we don't, we have the opposite of that mindset it seems like everybody's always fighting with each other willing to die kill each other for dumbest things and uh it's never been more evident than now currently in our society so that connection with the native american history and the artifacts and people having experiences i've been to probably eight to ten different reservations or areas where people have reported known phenomena and the connection is the native american history Maybe not at all places, but there is a lot that are connected that way. Yeah, I, I, I don't, <clears throat> I, I don't know what to think. Uh, what, who, who came first? Was it the uh, native or the glowing orb? But, but I certainly do feel that at least one thing came first, or one thing came of it. It was, I just think that they, they, these places were became special, or at least became legendary, even to them. For a reason, simple as that. Right. Then that. I don't have to add anything else to it for for the right. for the super skeptics or the super believer. 
it all to me i'm just saying is that like yeah that's it and it's and it's been a wild ride i don't you know i um i do think we should go off of some older teachings like being bringing back the the, the uh the stocks where we put people in them we should bring back the, <laughs> no i mean uh, no. why not I mean, and that and that's kind of my point with the artifacts and why I kind of focused on the artifacts in the in the in the natural environment. In the Eastern Valley at Skinwalker Ranch, there is an area um, where I found art, desert arcade artifacts that go back, you know, fifteen hundred years ago. In the exact same location, in the exact same location, I found paleo artifacts going back ten thousand years ago. So you have overlapping layers of history at one location. Why were these people drawn to this location? Was it because of the magnetic anomalies in the earth, the the spiritual aspect, the good hunting grounds? Who knows? 10,000 years ago, and I'm finding artifacts out there. That's a pretty big deal, I believe. You know, And they, were, they, they weren't dug. I didn't dig for them. I found them above ground. To find above ground paleo finds is very hard, very rare. And I got those <laughs> confirmed at the university or at the, you know, the museum in Vernal. And that's kind of how I was like, wow, that's that's kind of when my whole perception focused on the ranch was kind of looking for that stuff. And, you know, I spent a lot of nights out there sleeping on the rocks with the dogs at night because I really felt like I really felt like the more I immersed myself physically in the environment, the more layers are being pulled back. And I think Eric Bard kind of has that same mentality. That's why he's always out there. The more you immerse yourself in the environment the more layers get pulled back. And that can probably be anywhere if you think about it. If you go camping right now for a week out in nature, you come back feeling like a different person, more energized. Oh, I totally more, agree. Your whole perspective changes in life. And and I correlate my creativity from the ranch from my extended time on Skinwalker being alone, where I just had my camera to get through the weeks alone out there and hone my craft, basically. And... Um, and that's why I always tell people the ranch can be as dark as you want it to be or as light as you want it to be. It, it really depends on the individual. If you're going to go out there with fear in your heart, in your mind, you're going to have a bad experience. And I, I went down that route, route for a while too. You know, I had to learn from trial and error out there. Cause it, it's just, you know, my timeline when it comes to Skinwalker ranch, it was very, there's so many different layers involved, you know, different players involved, different narratives pushed, different things pushed. And, and uh, I don't know. It's And then there's another there's a TV show and documentaries and everything. And every, and that, yeah. like, there's T-shirts and, and hats. And it's it's so crazy to me to even look at it because it was never about that when I was there, you know. Um, it's good that the, it's good that the Uinta Basin is getting that focus because I think maybe drawing people out to that Uinta Basin and they're going out to McConkie Ranch and they're seeing the petroglyphs and they're going to Skinwalker. They're going out to McKee Springs and they're seeing those petroglyphs and they're just spending time out there camping by Bottle Hollow or wherever. They're kind of recharging those ancient things in our DNA that are probably pretty important for us. It's an interesting way to look at it for real. I, I, I truly, I, I do, like I said to you in the beginning, that's I really do believe that being in it for all that time. And I joke, I joke, I know for all my super skeptic friends, like I hate when I say this, but I joke around all the time with all like uh, the people I go and hang out in the swamp with, like right where the swamp used to be. Um, and uh, they, they all say that it's like, it's like, it, it is almost like, it remembers you. I know that's ridiculous right. for everyone. I know all my friends are going to roll their eyes at that, but I want to steer back yeah. real quick because you yeah. said something a second ago that really uh, made me think about it. Um, like for instance, um, do you think in one way, and this is not trying to like you know throw any uh, you know shade or anything towards any of the, the people over at Skinwalker Ranch now, although Mister Fugle hates my guts, but um, uh, do you think that to some degree though there is this element where that we we need to please the boss because I did bring up something about wh how I watched uh, Bard one time um, turn to look and i don't this could just be the worst time the worst angle i don't know what it was and it was during a stephen green street video he turns to look towards mr fugle and his face goes from being like i'm talking to everyone i'm just normal to like the smile like i've never seen another man smile so big towards this guy and all i thought was for a moment there is there a little bit of a layer like you described to me and i'm not saying he's not actually doing real science but for instance the way you described like your friend in the uh, backscatter and uh, the orbs, right. the dust stuff. 
Is there that little bit of that element of possibly reporting up? I think I think there might be a little bit of underlining. I mean, everybody wants to perform for their employer, right? I mean, I saw it firsthand with my with some of the guys on my team that really wanted to impress the boss, you know, and and not you know and report anything, you know, uh, quite data. And ultimately, you want to, but the the ranch is such a it's so difficult to collect stuff, even with all their cameras and stuff out there. And, 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 um, uh, like I said, they're in a tough position, you know, Brandon Fugel, uh, people give, people give the, the new team and Brandon Fugel a lot of grief. And I can, I can see where they're get their, where they get their, their views from, cause it, it's based on a TV show and stuff for me personally, my personal interactions with them have always been very positive and I've had more positive conversations with Brandon, um, about the ranch than my time with Bigelow. He's been more open to me about the ranch and investigations than my time with Bigelow. And that's no shade at Bigelow. That's just the absolute, absolute facts. Even with Colin Kelleher and stuff, um, me and Colin have a pretty good relationship, but it was also limited communication in some aspects. I felt like I felt like Colin was kind of in a position also where he's in a tough spot. You know, he's got to produce for Mr. Bigelow, and it's not easy working for him. And then we would come back from the ranch, and he's kind of like, okay, what did you guys find? Basically, you know, he didn't say that, but he's kind of – waiting for us to see, you know, what did you guys discover? And we're like, hey, we had maybe some type of weird experience over here or something like that. We tried our best to document it. It was kind of validated in his position as well. And that might be the ongoing um, thing from the start, even with NIDS. If you look at Valet's book, I forgot which one it was. Even Valet's book, it talks about how NIDS was having an open conversation about that. The NIDS were saying, you know, what are we supposed to do out here? We're not seeing UFOs. We're not seeing this. If you take into consideration NIDS, and during that timeline, you have a bunch of scientists, not a bunch, but you have a small group of scientists who just landed a dream job, right? You're getting, <laughs> paid, you're getting paid to do investigations on the paranormal and UFOs. Who doesn't want that job? I love that job. <clears throat> so by month two, three, four, you're not finding things. You better start producing something, yeah. at least keep the topic hot. I'm not saying they didn't lie about things or, or manipulate the data. But I, I know from being in their position, guys on my team as well were like, okay, there was a guy that actually legit said, this is what Mr. Bigelow is paying for, these reports. And I said, well, I'm not going to make up bullshit straight up, not doing it, because I came from a Q clearance. I'm not going to lie about shit. And uh, that guy got fired eventually. But so you have this muddling of the waters. So it's the same thing. It's like there's if, if the TV show went away tomorrow, and people were just allowed to go out there and kind of experience the ran ranch on a more spiritual aspect, it'd probably be a better situation for everyone. And that that was my thing. I think somebody out there in 2019 asked me that question. They said, you know, do you think we should just pack up and leave? And I said, yes, you should, because we're trespassing on hollow grounds. This is ancient land out here that needs to be respected, and we're not. We're making a mockery of it to to extent, you know. Um, but as far as Brandon Fugel and, and those guys, they've, they've allowed me to go back on the property and do collaborative investigations. And, and, and there's a lot of things that, that, that they investigate and collect data on that doesn't even make it to the TV show, you know? And I, it's just kind of, it, it, everybody's kind of in a rock between, you know, kind of stuck in their ways of like, what do, what do we do here? You know, nobody wants to lose their job. Right. And um, I know I didn't want to lose my job, but also, I just didn't feel comfortable lying on reports or not yeah. maybe lying. There are situations where you see something and like you said, it's your second week being out there alone. And you're like, Am I, did I see that? Did I, and you write it down. You just go, I, I thought I saw an orb in the Western Valley or, and I try to take a picture. I didn't get a picture. You know, it's just, it's, it's kind of weird, you know, but yeah. Well, I think it's because it's it's I, that re, that 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 tiny percentage of legitimate action that's happening and the true weird stuff out there that's really hard and has yet to been grasped by any major degree and studied by science in a way that we can understand it. It's just too infrequent. But because Steve, such a great contributor to the show, clearly I apologize again for missing this question. He wants to ask this. No, he, I'll answer anything. If Skinwalker Ranch. Oh my god, I need to switch monitors here. 
if the Skinwalker Skinwalker Ranch TV show allegedly isn't providing any monetary value and it's timing the investigation of the ranch, why do they keep it doing it for years? The majority of Fugo's ownership. Why do you believe so? Why do you believe they keep up the uh, entertainment side of it, so to speak, and let's, stopping let's the a, actual? Let's take a look at this, and uh, you have to really put your perspective back. That this all goes back to Project Stargate with how put off remote viewing, right? With Mount Wilson. And then Skinwalker Ranch, where Mount Wilson might be, uh, or not Mount Wilson, but NIDS might have been the first time a controlled environment where you are studying the phenomena and you have a group of scientists out there. And let's say you do deploy some type of psychotropic weapon technology on them and they're reporting seeing creatures coming out of portals, right? And and if you can fool the scientific <laughs> if, you, if you can fool the scientific community that they're seeing stuff like that, then you can fool anyone. And then you had the second control group during my time, which was all of us were prime military veterans. And we're having similar experiences. And then now you have a third control group, which is the civilian populace, right? And now there's a TV show, so you have this hive mentality of true believers that are pushing the narrative forward. Everybody wants to believe. So yeah. it's a con if you look at the consciousness aspect of what I'm talking about here, it's hitting all layers. It's hitting every level. It's going on because consciously, maybe that's the objective to consciously put us into a reality where we do have UFO contact, where we do have disclosure, is to have a group hive mentality to have a consciousness connection to that type of phenomena. Maybe that's the way they're maybe that's the way they're they're viewing it. I'm just saying. As far as and I can break it down because in Green Street's video, I didn't even know this but until he said it. Hal put off and Kit Green reached out to Brandon Fugel to buy Skinwalker Ranch. I didn't know CIA had their had had a had a background in, in realty a, a realtor's license because that's Mr. Bigelow's property when he sold it. Why is Hal put off and and Kit Green reaching out to anyone to buy Skinwalker Ranch? That needs to be done through Bigelow's people. But you're having these two guys who are the key players in all this stuff with TTSA, Stargate Pro, the, the Stargate Project, um, MRI stuff. And now that now it keeps on going down to under Fugel stewardship, you know, there's got to be a different agenda going on. The monetary value and the money and the, the history channel, all that stuff. I don't know anything about that stuff. I don't know if they're making money or if they're not making money. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, but I do believe that there is a different type of agenda going on. And it might be this consciousness hive effort to engage a, a global collectiveness, I guess, to maybe have a group experience. I've heard people on Skinwalker's Insider have had experiences from watching the live streams on the ranch. Is it just because of the hive mentality of wanting to believe that they're having experiences, or is there something really going on? I don't know. I mean, Mike Gelt would tell me it's the hive mentality the, of right. the person that might. But that 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 that's the problem, though. When I when I even drop say something like that, is that. Oh. I can't take anything away from someone's personal experience that they might have had, or even if it's been misidentified or whatever, whatever. Well, but when someone then, you know, well, like we were talking about earlier, they hear this and they start to see skinwalkers everywhere. You know, it's, well, just, let's just take a look back um, the last couple months. First, we had uh, Christmas lights that people thought were UFOs, right? Mm -hmm. And then we had uh, Vegas well, lights. Was and then we had Vegas lights in Las Vegas reflecting off clouds. People thought were UFOs. Then we had a metal buoy uh, wash up on the shore <laughs> of Japan. People thought that was UFOs, right? And then we had three balloons shot down. People thought those – people are still pushing that as UFOs that we shot. Let me tell you something. If you think that our military that still operates in, in, in planes that operate in GP8 jet fuel type of mechanics are shooting down – spaceships from different dimensions you are living in a fantasy world mm -hmm. i hate to hurt people's feelings i don't buy it i believe we shot down three balloons and what those balloons were who knows chinese weather balloons chinese spy balloons who knows but i don't believe for a second we shot down an yeah. actual alien spacecraft i don't live in that type of fantasy world um, but if you look at the society of the people pushing that agenda it goes back to this hive mentality of true believers even Colonel Alexander brought that up, and I listened to a podcast of his recently a while ago, and I actually really agreed with him on this. He he brought that up. He brought up the true the true believer 
mindset and how people are very easily to manipulate when they are a true believer. To look at uh, Paul Benowitz, right, and, yeah. and Rick, Rick Dottie. Look at Mr. Bigelow. Hate to say it, but he's basically another Paul Benowitz where people have manipulated him to an aspect to the point now where he's given out a million dollars for a consciousness study, for a, for a, for a paper. A million dollars for a consciousness study because he's obsessed with life after death, the consciousness of what happens after you die. I, that just blows me away. It's like this guy has had Skinwalker Ranch in his back pocket. All he had to do was spend a couple of years out there on the property, and he might have got the answers he was looking for, but instead he didn't do that. He stayed in Las Vegas and had other people that he was paying for, employers, to create data for him. No, that's not how it works. He should have been out there like I was out there and got to have that spiritual evolution, which I kind of believe I did being out there alone and going through the trials and tribulations of, of the fear and the experiences and the beauty of the property. That's the key to the connection. And this guy's given a million dollars now to, to read a paper that Buddhism did thousands of years ago. Right. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It's 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 crazy to me. But here we are, and it's really happening. They just posted something a couple of days ago, how they're down to the wire with more candidates for more consciousness paperwork uh, about the con the human consciousness, and that goes back to Hal Putoff, right? It goes back to Project Stargate. <laughs> so there's all the, it's all lined up. I mean, all you gotta do is just put the connect the dots. It's very easy. I think. I think I, I think I told you right that people had reached out to talk about that from uh, oh. uh, a couple people. One person who's not involved in it, but knows the other person. The other person reached out to me on their own, who's involved in that competition. They would like to talk about it because she's being told, uh, or well, crap, uh, this person's being told that the you know that the Bigelow may be trying to weaponize oh, the, the whole, the whole well, thing. All, the whole... What does what does ALSAP stand for? Advanced Aerospace Weapon Systems Application yeah. Program. What weapons are we talking about here? What yeah, are they? I don't know, but you know, <laughs> uh, they be that to me. Um, if I hear that there's a place that um, is super haunted or something like that, that's what you're hearing. In, you know, the, the scuttlebutt, if you will, is it's being you know haunted. There's portals. There's all types of weird stuff. I don't know. Maybe the guys just. This is what they're hearing. You go there and people actually report stuff like that as well. It would be nice to quantify something, to understand something that's going on and weaponize it in order to turn that into a less than lethal like weapon system and apply that geospatially onto the planet somewhere to make all the participants interact with that. That has been a generation type of weapon. In World War II, they wanted to float giant balloons through the clouds of Japan that look like monsters. They literally wanted all the people to look into the sky and see a giant monster. So Navy Naval Research Lab was, or someone, I can't remember who was asked to do it, but uh, it was, um, so like this just seems, screams of the well, same thing, different version of it, if you know what I mean. Um, you said it, not me. <laughs> I would say you're probably right about that. I mean, all you got to do is look at the players involved and look at their backgrounds of what they actually do. Of course, we want to weaponize things, right? Weaponize our curiosity, weaponize everything. I mean, oh, well, you said it. I mean, it just <laughs> that's that's the key to everything, right? So maybe the reason why I had an MRI was because I was involved in one of those weapon experiments and they wanted to see the damage that was done by those holograms or whatever whatever else, you know. Even Colonel Alexander said. There's a video of him going around saying back like 40 years ago how they implemented voices in people's heads uh, for, that made them believe they were alien abducted, right? And then in the Skinwalker book, it says that J that basically Jay Stratton and the other two guys are with them. They all heard voices in their heads about get off the property. So is Jay Stratton involved in this um and non-lethal weapons program as well? Was his family directly affected by that? Because if we're going to do an investigation, right, and you're going to say that Skinwalker Ranch is the result of my kids being hurt or my family being injured or I'm having serious, what I'm going to do an investigation. Where do I go first? The, the place I was just at, Skinwalker Ranch. I go there. Who am I going to interview? Ghost spirits, whatever. There's nobody <laughs> there to interview. But 
if I take a step back and say, okay, I want to interview every single person who's ever been involved with Skinwalker Ranch, starting with Colonel Alexander, which his background is in non-lethal weapons. And in fact, if you look at his name right now on Google, it says military applications of the paranormal. What a perfect place. Okay. And then you look at Kit Green and then Hal put off and all these guys, you line them all up and then you go and investigate these guys and you have a conversation with them. And if they say, no, we're not involved. then I guess, it, I guess, then I guess the ranch is just has an ability to hurt people to the point where, um, you know, people are getting cancer from orbs and stuff. Well, then that brings in the unethical things. So if you're saying Skinwalker Ranch is causing all this damage to people, you should not be allowing anyone to be out there, much less even animals out there, right? I mean, am I wrong here for bringing that up? It feels weird that they would, if, they would continue it feels to like, people, unless that's the whole bag, you know? And that's just it. They want to see the long-term mm -hmm. exposure of us being out there. There's no other way to really put it. How could you... Even Mr. Bigelow, and Travis Taylor said this in an interview last year, and he's kind of reverted back to it, but uh, he believed that Mr. Bigelow sold the property because Mr. Bigelow believed um, the ranch caused his wife to pass away. Now, I'll say I know a lot about Mr. Bigelow's personal background, and he had a lot of negative things happen in his life that I won't get into. And I heard while I was working there that he believed his ex extended time on the ranch caused the negative things to happen to his family. Well, okay, so that would explain why the whole time I was out there for six years, he never visited. Neither did Colin, neither did James Lukatsky, neither did Jay Stratton. Those guys were not out there. The guys who were out there were a very small group of us. And I guess our families are expendable, right? I guess my health is expendable. That is the reality of truth that nobody wants to talk about or have a conversation with me. I don't understand. Just fess up, own up to it, and press forward. I'm already, like I said before, it's just about me closing a chapter for my family and for right. my friends, too. I'm representing a group of guys. I'm representing a group of guys, right, that just want answers to some of the things that we experienced, right? And now it's all muddied because of the OSAP program comes out and there's other players are involved that we didn't even know about. And there's other things were going on that we didn't even know about. And then people are saying, how does it feel to know you're a guinea pig? The psychological, when that, when that statement was made to me, my entire life got thrown up and upside down. Everything. Now I'm second guessed every experience I've ever had on the property. I've second guessed everything. And then that led me down to my road of investigating and making connections and talking to people and, I'm so tired of wasting energy. I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this. I'm, I'm thankful for you giving me the opportunity to talk about this because the only reason why I'm even talking about this is so they can never erase that timeline, right? And they've tried. They want to erase that timeline, the OSAP timeline of the guys who are actually out there, not the ones who just visited the ranch for a day, the guys who are out there day in, day night, sacrificing everything for that ranch. And there's only a small group of us. And I'm here to represent those guys, right? Mm. And those guys are all veterans. And I'm a veteran. You're a veteran. So I feel I have a responsibility to be their voice and get some answers, right? And I work in the veteran community every single day. And that's why I get so up, I get so upset when people talk about this UAP threat narrative, right? And I get really upset when it's native, when it's other veterans who are pushing that narrative, right? UAPs are a threat. How can we say that when our veteran community, 22 of us a day commit suicide? And that is a low ball estimate. And I hate to even put a number on veteran suicides, but that is the ugly truth that nobody wants to tackle. We want to live in a fantasy world where UAPs are a threat. Bullshit. Birds. If you Google it right now, 97% of all aviation accidents, damages are results of birds. Does that mean we need a, a bird UAP or a bird task force to take birds out of the sky because of planes? It's fucking, it's bullshit. I hate to say curse, but I'm so sick of this shit, dude. I'm so sick of listening to the, the, just, the just the noise. And the bird task force does sound good, though. I'm just saying. It bird. does, but that's what the government does. It creates more jobs for the government. 
<laughs> right? Because if we can say UAPs are a threat, then what we'll do, we'll roll out technology that the Space Force has probably had for decades to fight off the UAP threat. And that technology will be used against China and Russia and Iran and Brazil, who just, by the way, dropped the U.S. dollar, right, or are going to drop the U.S. dollar. You don't all think right. we're going to go to war? You're crazy. We're, we're, we're going, going to war. war. We're going to war, all right. That's for damn sure. But I'm just, I'm so tired of it. It's just like, <clears throat> just because you're a Navy pilot or an Air Force pilot or uh, any, any pilot, and you see something in the skies or you see something that you're not familiar with, doesn't necessarily mean it's alien in nature. It doesn't mean it's alien in nature. It means that you saw something that you're unfamiliar with, technology, which may not be UFOs. It may be our own technology or an adversary's technology, right? Mm. But the thing that makes the most money is we say it's alien technology, right? That's the big thing with craft retrievals. Everybody's trying to say craft retrievals are aliens. Listen, when I was in the Air Force for 10 years, I went on several crash and recovery missions for the Air Force. I have extensive knowledge when it comes to this. I will tell you, there's a lot that goes into crash and recovery retrievals. And you being a military veteran as well, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not like they just pack up the things and go. No, there's investigations that go for months, if not years, on any type of uh, crash retrieval. So when there's things being tossed around crash retrieval, are they talking about finding meteorites in the Earth? Or are they really believe that an alien crashed and we got the tech and that's what we're using now? I guess the U.S. is pretty lucky, right? We're pretty lucky to get that tech. It's I, crazy because all the people, and here's the thing, all the people that want to talk about, you know, UAPs being a threat and the, the pilots who report this, I automatically I look at their background. Where have they worked? None of them have worked in the Nevada desert. The 86% owned, government-owned Nevada desert, Area 51, Totem Paw Test Range, United States Air Force, Creech Air Force Base. None of those people talk have worked there. Maybe some of that tech is being tested there or created there. Cannot confirm or deny it, but I'm just saying. I worked out there and I saw stuff. But I signed NDAs for that stuff. So just because you're uh, in the military and you report something doesn't mean necessarily it's alien. I don't. I, I want to believe like everybody else. I do. There's some days where I'm a true believer too. Yeah. And I'm like, man, it, it is aliens, man. I do. I want to believe it. And then there's a lot of days I'm like, no, that's probably our technology, man. It really is. And these hearings that are coming up in April, I'm already going to guess it's just more, it's going to be more stories that's going to discombobulate the UFO community or, you know, more people will bicker and fight and, and be distracted by it. I don't see anybody come with factual evidence. And if, and if you're not going to come with factual evidence, then you're wasting everybody's time here. If you're going to go under oath and say you have a story to tell and you have nothing to back it up, it just seems like a complete waste of time. It does. I, I, I am afraid they're going to bring up, like, put off as the one of the whistleblowers or something. They're like, oh, we're going to have whistleblowers come up here. Then they're going to have, like, put off go up there and say whatever the F he wants. And, then, and, people, you know, will, and people will believe it, you know. Like, oh, okay. it. Um, you know, a couple of things I wanted to ask you uh, about, about the uh, special access program. You know, as you, you would have, you have some, obviously some uh, experience here. So, was Bigelow was Bass officially a special access program? No. Nope. When you were no. No, I, I believe they want to use Skinwalker Ranch in order to gain a special access program contract. Hundred percent. It was definitely not a special access program. Um, okay. Not the ones I'm familiar with. I believe they try to use Skinwalker Ranch and they collected, you know, they, they also bought all the MUFON data and everybody says, oh, the $22 million was used to create the, the database that is used to this day. MUFON created that data. Bigelow bought it. So, no, Bass didn't create all the data. Now, we did reports every single day. Those reports are journal entries that we did at Skinwalker Ranch. And I will say that Bass, before I got hired, those guys did go out and do investigations. If anybody reported a UFO, they would go out and collect data. I'm not downgrading that. They did. Right. Um, but there's there's like reports that Big Oil Aerospace had a skiff and all this stuff. No, we didn't. There's no skiff at Big Oil Aerospace. There, we did have a skiff, but it's not at Big Oil Aerospace. And it wasn't a skiff like like you or I were probably familiar with in the military. It wasn't like that type of technology, like that type of sophisticated skiff. It was kind of like uh I don't, know. I don't want to get into it, but I was just like, that's a skiff? That's not a skiff. 
It was but a con it, Xbox, I'm sure. Uh, shipping it to uh, I got, like I said before, man, glassdoor.com unfortunately paints a real picture of the reality of all this shit, dude. It does. Yeah. I, I, I just, and it, it's everything is spun so out of control now. I mean, everything is just spinning out of control. I'm a little voice that does and what I what I say here will be washed over tenfold by the by the distractions coming forward, you know, and, and it doesn't matter to me because I'm still going out with, like I said, Carl the Crusher and these other guys and and doing investigations where we believe that we're finding real stuff and it's the Native American connection. You know, we're getting actually um, Navajo elders confirming some of the things that we're talking about with my Philip photography and it's so validating to hear that. And they're coming forward now and talking more about it, about the ancient ways, about the old ways. And um, I don't know. It, it just seems I have so much jumble in my head of all the places I've worked at and then Skinwalker. And then I get kind of just spun up where I just like, I feel like some days I should just close everything out and just let the narrative play out. Cause it doesn't really matter what I say. It's going to, it's going to play out regardless have you been approached by um by uh some of these disclosure people in the last year to take part in something on television in the sense that they've they've been like come on be i you know be on our teams type of and i say these people but i mean someone like maybe chris from mellon lou elizondo stratton himself I've been approached by TV shows and um, TV shows. Uh, other channel networks and even alien cons or other type of MUFON organizations to be a guest speaker. And I turned them down. And it's not because I I just don't have the time. I really don't. I'm a full-time dad with three boys and I have a, a full-time career that, and I have bills to pay. I don't have time to go on these circuits and talk about, um, stuff now maybe one day eventually i will well, maybe some some of them if i'm talking about what i'm talking about right here on, on this channel about native american stuff yeah but i'm not going to sit there and, and lie about shit on on a <laughs> stage just to get some dollars in my pocket i have i you know that's and that's the whole thing with the university of maryland with taras matla that university reached out to me because they saw something that i was doing online with the photography and they, re they recognized something pure and they said, hey, would you be willing to – they actually they wanted to buy my archive. And I actually donated my archive to the University of Maryland. I donated 3,000 images to the University of Maryland, so it would always be archived forever. That That's way cool. that timeline can never be erased, no matter what. Really cool. And, really and cool. yeah, I thought that was awesome. And it's also allowed my kids to go back and see that. And now through the University of Maryland, you know, we want to produce like a, a memoir to go with that art exhibit so that way – it's just something that set in stone. That timeline will never go away. And it's through somebody who was actually there, not sitting in the Pentagon, on, in, you know, reading reports. And um, uh, oh, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I'm sorry. Can, yeah, you can finish. I apologize. Oh, no, that, that, that's, that's pretty much it. So, yeah, I, I've been approached. I've been approached and I've turned down a lot, but not because of like, oh, I'm better than you. No, it's because I don't have to, I don't have time. When and you say I approached, at, sorry, now I get now I gotta have to I grab it yeah. real quick. But did you say I asked uh, about like Lou Elizondo oh. or Chris Mellon or all those guys have have those figures specifically either of those two? No, Mellon's never reached out to me. Um, um, Jay Jay Strand has never reached out to me, which I think is absolutely insane since he was basically my boss, overhead boss during OSAP. It just it it seems so. But uh, Lou Elizondo and I were supposed to meet um, to have a conversation. To pass data, pass intel. Recently? Because I, no, this is like two years ago. This is uh, last year. Last year, we were supposed to meet in Montana. I, so I, I took a job in Montana, and I was out there for about six months. During that time, we emailed each other to meet up in Montana because he lives in Wyoming, and I lived in Stevensville, Montana. And it never happened because of a snowstorm. But I want to talk to him because I want to know why he walked away from the OSAP program or why he distanced himself from the OSAP program. And I have a, I have a pretty good idea why he distanced himself from the offset program, and I felt like he had information that I wanted to hear, I, I needed to hear, and I want to hear still. 
And I think at some point, me and him probably should have a conversation face to face. I don't like doing like phone calls. I like to do in person, face to face, because I'm going to see if somebody's lying to me in person, or I'm going to catch certain things. You know, I have 25 years in law enforcement investigations, so that's why I like to go face to face with people and say, okay, tell me what you knew, and I'll tell you what I know, and let's put the cards out and see if we can find out what's going on. And I believe that the reason why he walked away from all staff is because. He's not a dummy. He knows that there was some probably some unethical things going on. He probably read some reports, and him being a veteran himself was like, "Whoa, we got guys on Skinwalker Ranch alone out there, just on a security aspect level threat alone. You don't do that." But then they're having experiences and MRIs done, and all this other shit. He's probably like, "I don't want nothing to do with that." I don't blame him. He's right. I uh, I think that's one optimistic way to look at it. <laughs> I don't know if I adjust it. <laughs> it is. Um, so, uh, uh, Chris, you know, I, I didn't want to miss this. Here. I know you spoke about it a minute for a, a moment, and I know that's not, it really wasn't your avenue. Um, but uh, Lord Ludicrous here says, what percentage of the $22 million was spent on salary? Do, do, do you know anything else other than, I know you probably didn't hear when you were there, right? You probably didn't hear anything about the $22 million. Oh, no. Didn't know anything about that. Um, I have no idea. No idea. I, okay. I have no idea. I know we were, those of us who are on the ranch were, so this is, I talked about it last time how I quit uh, Big Ol' Aerospace, no notice, and went to Area 51 full time. And then I ended up quitting Area 51 because they messed up my pay. And then went back to Big Ol' Aerospace. When I went back to Big Ol' Aerospace, they actually gave us, those of us who were going to the ranch, a thousand dollar bonus every time you would go as like a bonus to go up there. Um, but as far as people's salaries, I have no idea. I know when the money got cut and uh, Mr. Bigelow bankrolled it himself with his own money. So I got to give him props for that. I mean, we didn't have anything on the property. Like I look at the TV show now and I'm like, man, they got everything. Never. They have everything. We didn't, we didn't have not one working camera out there. Not, we had a couple of game cameras that we used eventually, but we didn't have, I mean, and those of us out there who, are, who worked out there know for a fact, we didn't have the resources needed to get the job done. And then the manpower. If, yeah. if, if our job was to protect the property, which it was, and also collect data and try to figure out the phenomena, then there should have been scientists out there until 2016 because we want to talk about how in 2011 and 2012, the ranch, um, the, the phenomena dried out. And that's why there was no more uh, involvement. No, that's not true. We still had experiences out there, but nobody wrote them down and nobody reported them that much because nobody cared. Because like I said before, there was a lack of communication. So why am I going to waste time filling out a report about seeing something bizarre when it's not going anywhere and it just felt like i'm not going to sound like a crazy person on paper for no reason yeah. there's no objective hey, and, so, and, <laughs> and, and, and bigelow's uh and bigelow's defense his entire you know the aerospace side of the house was his focus that was his focus so the ranch was secondary nobody cared about the ranch and, and we were just out there holding it down you know, um, there's a few questions here in the chat for other people yeah. asking uh, uh, multiple things, but I'd like I got one for you myself, of course. But uh, you know, one, one person wants to know what you did for 25 years in law enforcement, and the next would yeah. be I think it's tied to that, of course, would be can you elaborate what he did at Area 51? Yeah, uh, the 25 years of, of history comes from being first stationed at Nellis Air Force Base and Security Forces Main Base Police Squadron uh, for the 99th on Main Base for 10 years, okay. and then. You know, being trained through the through the DOD version of police academy, and doing investigations through them, and then also through the uh, DOE of security police officer, you go through investigations as well. Very small course, but you also expose some things out there as well. And then from there, the investigations we did on Skinwalker Ranch, and then when I left Skinwalker Ranch, currently now I'm a federal police officer, uh, almost five over five years now in that background. So it's a about 25 years in law enforcement security overall but investigations specifically and i've been trained by three different uh, agencies basically investigations and interviews and data collecting and evidence collecting and all that stuff and and uh yeah so that but uh this so that hopefully hopefully that answers the question 
Um, but started in the Air Force and then DOE and then Bass and then currently now federal police officer with, I can't, I don't want to say the organization I'm with, but currently there. Um, with Air 51, it was, I went through courses as well for Air 51, mostly espionage courses. But my overall objective when I first got hired there was escort duty. And then I ended up working the Janet detail. And then I quit and went back to Bass. The Janet detail being the flights? Yes. Was, yeah. So you, uh, did you uh, Work bring security people on and, and then check everyone on and uh, whatnot? Yeah. And, uh, in and out? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So yeah. you were one of those people that they would people be staring at with binoculars from the other side yeah, of the, the, the airport. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a lot of friends that still work there. A lot, a lot of friends because Nellis Air Force Base is basically, you know, like I said before, Nevada is owned eighty six percent by the government. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that goes on out there for the overall objective for the Air Force, which is air power global dominance. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how that's achieved is by keeping everyone in the dark, including our own government, the Pentagon, Congress. Is to keep our own adversaries. Is to keep everyone in the dark. We're not going to deploy technology out unless we absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We release stuff out periodically, which we just released the B twenty one Raider. That's old technology. <laughs> That's old tech. Nah. That's old tech. But it's released now as new tech. Okay, um, and that's how we, we do that to stay ahead. And it's about money and funding because if we release technology tomorrow, that would replace. The entire inventory, we're talking trillions of dollars of money gone. Yeah. If we released, like, uh, whatever. Yeah, disruptive technology is the, one of the straight, hardest and best things that, you know, can happen. Right. So Nellis Air Force Base, if, you are, if you're a cop out there, a lot of doors open up because there's lots of stuff to work out. You know, you got a lot of opportunities out there. And um, and so I have a lot of friends that work at 51 still in the test site, and, and I have a lot of connections out there. Um and uh, I was just out there in, in July and talked to some of those guys about some of the topics we're talking about right now. Very cool. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, we're probably going to break out of here in a little bit. And I appreciate you hanging on me for an hour and a half, uh, Chris, for sure. A, a couple more things I want to ask him. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on uh, Laurel Dutta? Chris says, Chris has to know Bob Lazar is full of shit. What do you think about <laughs> Bob Lazar? Man. I think there's definitely some holes in the story for sure. I think he knew just enough information and probably get himself in trouble you know i don't doubt he probably worked at 51 now what he did only he would know and that's how that place works you know me and you can work in that 51 for 25 30 years and we would never know what we did and we could work right next door to each other that's how that place was set up but um i don't know i think that there's some there's some holes in his story and 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 uh well, I, that's his story. I mean, if he wants to throw himself on that sword and say he saw technology that was alien and he saw aliens there, that's his story. Do I believe that? No, I do not believe that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what, I mean, I, uh, you know, for me, I just, I just had a, a simple secret clearance, you know, nothing impressive. And um, <clears throat> the questions that they asked and even I, I extended the, the, the interview just by just by bullshitting around when I shouldn't have, um, you know, were so intrusive into like my past and every little thing that I did. And like, my stepfather was a, a Jew, survived uh, his 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 father rather oh, wow. survived the survived the Holocaust. They fled to Canada. His father, you know, died in the town uh, years ago. Had tattoos still on his arm, and um, <clears throat> and they asked me about him endlessly. You know, who did he work for when he was in Germany before the war? I'm like, I don't know any of these questions. <laughs> so how exactly does Bob Lazar get to where he gets with the relationships and the tags that you would have on a background check? I don't care what year it is either. Some that's popping yeah. up. The criminal yeah, that, court case. Yeah, and I gotta be honest, when I didn't know much about Bob Lazar's story just besides what I saw on like on TV and whatever else, but until people online started bringing up those points and they're absolutely right. If you have anything in your background, you're not going to anything. I'm talking if you have outstanding doubt or debt um, connections with some of the connections he's, <laughs> he's had in the past, you're not going to get the clearance you think you're going to get. And that goes hand in hand with the guys who are on these TV shows, the scientists and stuff. If you're a scientist on a TV show, a popular TV show, and you're saying you're part of this task force or you have this degree, 
I will tell you 100%, you will never get a clearance that you think that you deserve to know what's really going on because that's reserved for the real scientists and engineers who sign their life away. They sign their life away and they're not going to ever be on a TV show or on social media or anywhere. You're not going to know about those guys until they're on their deathbed. And I know that specifically from where I used to work at. Um, so with Bob's story, I think even Jeremy Corbell said in, in an interview, you know, have you ever tried to, you know, make up a story to get laid based implementing that, you know, like, like Bob's story was just for him to get laid. I don't know. I mean, I never met the guy personally. And once again, this is why I like to meet people face to face and, and find out what's really going on. Because if somebody, if I feel like somebody's lying to me in person, I'm going to pull that card very quickly and say, Hey, what's going on here? Cut the bullshit. Is it to make money? Is it look cool? Whatever. But um, in, in, in Bob's story, there's there's a lot of holes in it that are just completely overlooked. I know Stephen Cambion did a whole thing on it, and people hate people don't like Stephen Cambion. I actually enjoy his show because he doesn't give a shit. <laughs> he doesn't give a shit, yeah. and he's funny. He's funny. Now, is he over the top a little bit? Sure. Oh, we all are, you know. But we need to have these different voices in this conversation, <laughs> you know. If I, if I disagree with you online, I'm not going to automatically block you. If you're the type of guy to automatically block somebody because you disagree with what they're saying, that, that says a lot more about you versus them. Mm -hmm. So we need right. people like Stephen Cammy and we need people like your show and other shows that kind of draw the line, right, and call people out. Because there's so many of these true believers who believe everything. And I hate to, you know, I kind of want to be a believer too, like a, like a true believer. But with my background, it's really tough for me sometimes to, to eat those cookies, you know, those true <laughs> believer cookies. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. I, cause I'm so jaded, man. I'm so jaded with my background where I see something online I'll look into it and I start diving into it. And I'm like, Oh shit, that's our All technology. Right. Or how like did Nick it get West. to this point of belief? How yes. So many people get to this point where there's only one little voice being like, no, 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 take a look at this it, plane or, and I'll say this, until until an actual representative from Groom Lake or the DOE or United States Air Force out of Air Combat Command holds an official press conference on the White House lawn and says, okay, folks, we have a real alien UAP problem and we don't know what to do with it or we're trying our best to figure it out, then maybe you have my attention. Because, And I, I get that your Air Force has had um, uh, interviews and stuff like that. I'm talking, I want to see the big players come out and say, okay, yeah. we have a a aliens. And then why are we waiting for the government to disclose the information anyways when it's the same government who's been hiding the information? Yeah, I, uh, that's why I really get torn, though. Sometimes I really, sometimes I think that if anything, it, um, it was just mimicked by people like Mr. Alexander and his friends rather than actually ever, you know, achieved because... right. To, to, to suggest that all these other departments are also involved in, in obfuscating the entire thing or obstructing the entire thing, like, or covering it up, the early warning systems, IR satellites tracking fast moving objects in space or right. getting hot on, on, in, you know, reaching orbit, all of those things, all of these organizations, every one of them, and a lot of them are not connected really whatsoever, other than the fact that their branches are kind of equal in budgets. So that's like why they kind of have the same power intelligence. You all of them all have to be covered, you know, that cover up has to continue, or they do know some weird stuff, but it's but it's what they've created based off what they've learned by looking at the weird stuff or, or seeing right. the my it's my personal thing, but forget that yeah. we got to wrap this thing up though. But the last thing I have to ask you, the very last thing, yeah, could you get me any other people that work with you to, over there at Skinwalker Ranch anytime back in the day? Come on. It, it, other than other than the ones we know, who 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 yeah. wants to finally make an appearance on a tiny little show? Get their feet like, yeah, I got a couple guys that are probably willing to talk. Um, I've been talking to them more and more about it. Um, I feel I think they feel more comfortable now to talk. And, and and there's two guys specifically. Their input is very important. One of the guys was there at the very start of Bass, at the oh, very I'd start of the ramp, and. He has a very similar background with me with the country, growing up in the country. So his view of stuff was very no nonsense about things. And he even he had some weird experiences, you know. 
I'm not ruling out the ranchers this bullshit. No, there's something mm -hmm. weird there. I, now, I, there, there's there's uh, my explanation is the Native American stuff. Now there's other explanations to you know whatever else, and then there's another guy who I value his import his input because he actually viewed the ranch more of a spiritual aspect, and he's very religious, and uh, I'm not, but he is, and his and he prayed a lot while he was out there. He believed there was something evil going on out there. And uh, I will tell you, evil is there. You can feel it if you allow it to, to kind of manifest in your mind. Um, and I kind of saw that with some guys out there. But um, there's a couple guys that I think want to talk, you know. Um, it'd be great to have them in conversation with them because they're going to provide good insight uh, uh, about some of the things I've been saying as well, you know. Um, there was also a, a 2014 interview that somebody sent me recently that I, I remember listening to it back in 2014. Ryan Skinner sent it to me. It was an interview with Chip on the Paracast Network. Did you listen to that? So it was an interview in 2014 on the Paracast Network, an uh, officer named Chip. And I remember listening to that interview at Skinwalker Ranch at the East Gate. And everything he said in that interview, I was like, holy shit. He talked about MRIs. He talked about feeling like a guinea pig. All this stuff. I wish he would come out more and do a, do a show or come forward or maybe contact me. or um, We have mutual friends. I know that. Let's and uh, that but I'll have to send you that podcast link because that show was pretty much uh, way before all this stuff. And he said things that I didn't even know about. Interesting and it's, it's, over here, but I, I think you might have sent to me on Twitter, and I might have listened to it. I think I might I just have a terrible memory. I would yeah, just like to, it would be huge like for a, you to come back on with these folks too, Chris. That'd oh, be great. That'd be, if, that'd if, be, if, awesome. that'd be amazing because would like to have to hear all you guys chat and kind of like reminisce about it would be pretty cool. Yeah, and you also need to have uh, maybe reach out to Carl the Crusher and have him on your channel because he's got a very good insight, and he doesn't really hold back things either. But he does. He's very. Uh, he, he does his. He does his due diligence and. Digging in deep, and man, he's it's very good at I what he does. Well. Got good stuff there, it's Carl. Carl, you're on the spot now. If you're still in the chat, I sent you an email a week and a half ago. Hey, you want to come on the show, man? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's awesome. He's awesome. Uh, I mean, he, I, he's he's a really good friend, and uh, I really appreciate his uh, input. And uh, we got some we got some cool things uh, planned for this year, so. Well, I, I look forward to seeing it, and uh, and if if that happens, if that comes, uh, you know, if that actually uh, something comes out of this where you get some people to to talk about who haven't spoken before, I'd love to be the first place. Although that doesn't matter to me as long as the story gets sure. out there. But yeah, to have you guys on on a panel or something would be great, or just a couple of you. So please keep me in mind. I'd I'd uh, yeah. you know I, I pay in high fives. So <laughs> if the guy, you know, anyways, that's cool, uh, me man. That uh, I really appreciate you answering all the questions for the chat that we could ask. Yeah. And uh, sorry if I missed anyone's. Thank you for the super chats, everyone. And uh, again, uh, Chris, thanks for killing it. I don't even know where to go with this because I have so many. I still have so many questions I want to ask oh. you. Well, I have all... If anybody has any questions, just message me on on Twitter. There we go. Or, and I'll, I'll have a conversation with anyone. I'm not. I don't have anything to hide. I, I, I'm not the one painting. I don't know. Whatever. I, <laughs> like it, I'm, I'm blunt about stuff and i think people appreciate that but that's just how i've always been my whole career i've always been hey what's up let's you know whatever yeah anyway. what was uh what was chip's last name real quick by the way do you remember, do you remember or was it, was a, it, was a, it was a it was an alias name and he went by chip and i, I don't remember his full name i'll have to i'll i'll have to find out and i'll, I'll message you um i can't okay. remember his full name um but Reaching. he would be great to have on the show if he's still listening, he, a lot of these guys, man, just don't care. They're just like, you know what, whatever. Yeah. They just don't care. And uh, the only reason why I do care, like I said, is because it's the closer chapter in my life. And that's just it, really. That's And I, I felt like this last trip to D.C., I did close that chapter. The, you know, the chapter is closed. I'm going forward now. And uh, that's just it. Well, I, I look forward to hearing what, what comes of this and uh, and follow Chris over at Chris Bartell, SWR, Skinwalker Ranch on Twitter. Hit him up there. Uh, you know, honestly, great. Thank you for so, sharing so much. And um, I, I 
barely even touched my notes I made here of oh, <laughs> stuff I want to ask you. Hey, but you know, I'll come, I'll come back whenever you want, man. No problem. I'd really appreciate that if you could. That'd be great. Yeah. I still have so much I want to ask because, quite frankly, I just I I want to get very specific sometimes when you ask these things. But I know we have a lot to cover, so um, yeah, I know. you know, just like I, I bet you, I bet you still have memories of conversations with these individuals. Like you, oh like the, my god, I bet. You know, and, and, that, and there's and, a lot of and, insight there. I bet. There, there is, and, that, and that's why I wrote that memoir to help remember. It, writing that memoir brought back a lot of memories. Like, whoa, I forgot about this conversation. I forgot about this. I forgot about yeah. that. So. Well, I, I really look forward to hearing from it. And if you, if those guys uh, come around and they and they want to hop on and talk to us, that'd be freaking amazing. I'd be sure. I'd be forever in your debt, man. That'd be amazing. Oh, no. Iron oh. sharpens iron, man. We're all here to help each other. So hey. <laughs> well, I really appreciate uh, appreciate that. I certainly could use some help with this operation. Have you seen this thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's great, man. I, I love it. All right, Typical all right. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. No, I'm really gonna try. I swear the production is nah, gonna be good. Crazy. And uh, I know we're, I'm supposed to take everything seriously, and this is supposed to be a real production. But since we do have a former person that worked at uh, Area 51, and he, his background, I'm sure the national. Uh, uh, security agency is listening to this conversation right now, so I just want to say this, just in case anyone's listening, uh, that Donald Rumsfeld is one hot piece of ass, right? <laughs> Anyone? All right. Absolutely. All right, let's get out of here, Recon. Thank you very much for hanging out with us. The Super Chats, everyone. Uh, Steve, thank you for all the questions, and um, and Lord Ludacris as well. We'll get at, uh, on Twitter to talk to Chris there and figure out uh, and listen to that interview with Chip there. We'll find that in the paragraph. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try to post it on Twitter and and find Excellent. it. Thank you very much, Chris. Take it easy. Have a good you night, too. everyone out there. Thank you for being here. Take it easy, Recon. See you, man. Take it easy. There's nothing cooler than being a lone wolf, except at wolf picnics, when you don't have anyone to do the wolf wheelbarrow races with. <laughs>